Is that it? Hey, there you go. There it is. Finally. Man. Man. See, I, that does sound better, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, because you sound really good if you call. I'm. This is Oscar, by the way. You sound. <laughs> you sound really good over over the uh, the FaceTime. It just it just sounds so right. much better. It almost sounds like you're right here. Yeah. Man, you're... Instead of in the sticks. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I said he only gets one bar, so probably that's a... <laughs> he was going to climb the pole. So. All yeah. right. Now all I got to do is uh, hit record here, and we can uh, have stellar radio. Yeah, have have radio, a radio thing going on here. Okay, that is a thing will work now. What's going on here? Oh, there, there it goes, maybe. Okay. It's just a just a day full of uh, electronic glitches, I guess. Uh, okay. That's slow like mine was. No, it's usually it's usually right there. Yeah, okay. Of course, I have. Uh, it's been on all day, so we might not be able to record it, Rick. We'll just have to remember real good. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I got the camera going too over there, so you can look and smile at the camera. Oh, and geez. that's also recording. So, oh, so are they that's see running my, right to the board? Are they going to see my back then? Or well, be, yeah, that's oh. why you can turn that way a little oh, bit, so hi. that way you can oh. look over there at the camera. Okay. And, you know, people okay. can get excited. Yeah, boy, I sure will. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I want to uh, tell you, too, right off. Is that you blowing your nose there, or what? <laughs> I'm actually unzipping something. Yeah. I won't oh, describe okay. what. Look out. Okay, we're, we're, we're taping now, so there we go. It's better. Anyway, um, yeah, I just want to, first of all, well, we'll just get this thing started, and I'll, I'll compliment you on the, <laughs> on the whole thing. Talking tunes, and we've got a... a couple of very special gentlemen here today and of course they were uh, the famous the famous was it with WLCS that yeah. you got okay and WLCS the uh, uh, the morning jukebox so Saturday you, morning jukebox yeah, yeah infamous is more like it Oscar. infamous yeah, yeah there you go right. and uh, you have the Rick Hickman who's joining us uh, via Facebook whatever the heck it is called him know. out of retirement he yeah. doesn't just do this for anybody we, no, we, so. he, we heard uh, a little earlier that he was zipping his zipper up so we're all good we're ready to go <laughs> <laughs> I don't hear anything from him, though. He's being quiet right now. But, Rick, how are you? Well, things have been terrific. Good. Now, I just, first of all, I want to compliment you because uh, your intros to these uh, different interviews, the, the Tommy James one, the, the especially the, like the Ernie Harwell, the, um, and, of course, Louis Anderson, who you did, and who even even said he was going to save his intro and, and uh, play it every day when he gets up in the morning. And, and also with uh, uh, Leslie Gore, that one, uh, just amazing what, you know, your interview or your intros for the interviews. So they were great. Just great. Yeah, nobody ever complained that I couldn't suck up with the best of them. I know. You were great at it. It was good. It was good. It was always a nice way to launch it into, you know, one thing that John and I always wanted to get across with famous people is that they're always afraid that you want the gotcha answer, the gotcha interview. And we wanted them to know, A, we know you're your history we really do adore you as a person and uh, you know whatever it is that made you famous whether it was sports or television or certainly music and we wanted them to know that we were on their side and that usually got things rolling in a pretty good fashion for us you know your your interview actually uh, made me want to read the book and john was going to lend me his copy of my my sister was interested she heard the show and she was interested herself so she bought a book and sent it to me on amazon but tell told me i have to send it to her when i get done with it so so i've been reading the uh, the book on tommy james and i'm like halfway through yeah, me, the mob, and the music, and I would certainly recommend it to anyone, especially if you're not a great reader. I never have been. Yeah, me either. I picked up that book, and man, I slammed through that book, and it was just so fascinating to read how they were connected with a background in the mafia during the mid-70s when there were over 400 mafia hits that happened in a three-year span, if I remember correctly. And, you know, Tommy was kind of in the uh, the maelstrom of all of that and always had to be in constant fear because he was their main property. Would he be the next casualty? What a story that would have been, too. Right, right. And, you know, they, the the center, I got to the center where they had uh, all the pictures, too, of the different guys. And uh, yeah. they 
definitely, you know, most of them were like their mug shots, you know. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, yeah. All the mob bosses, yeah. yeah. People don't know to what we're relating. Tommy worked for Roulette Records, and they were controlled by the mob. So you can just imagine all the different facets and mystery that uh, that would entail. Yeah. So I've got the book here, right here. I'm like, I'm like, I can say about halfway through, and there was there was something in there that he said. I thought I wrote it down, but I didn't. But um, anyway, there was something in there he, that he said that, that struck me as funny because I used to work for WGVU, and they sent me along to, um, oh, here it is. They sent me along to California to check out some of the new shows that were coming to PBS. And one of the shows that they were trying to push was Peter Noon and Eric Burden we're going to do a music show together. Mm. And I thought, <laughs> really? Just a natural yeah. carry. Who would yeah. have thought of that? I know, right? Well, it didn't cut I don't think it ever worked. But yeah, this is like 10 <laughs> years ago. But anyway, the funny thing was, is what he said in there is when he first he first uh, had his first big, you know, crowd of, of all those people because he's opening for uh, the animals and opening for uh, Herman's Hermits. And he said he talked to um, Eric Burden and Eric was just a, real pain in the butt and but peter noon was just like the happiest friendliest guy in the world and that's exactly the way it was when i went to this thing and i talked to eric burden like oh man i love your music and this and this talk this and this and he goes yeah he was like it looked like his hair was all stuck up you know like he hadn't taken a shower for a couple of days you know and but peter yeah, your Newman, impression man, of him is exactly what it is 100 yeah. percent of the people that have ever met him right and then peter noon was like hey how you, how you doing yeah. you know he's shaking my hand he's got this big smile on his face you know he's bouncing around i think i called him peter moon too and he didn't say anything, but, yeah but yeah so i thought that was pretty cool and i'm reading that in the book and i'm saying yeah that's exactly how eric burden is exactly so but anyway um now you guys interviewed a ton of people um and we had, we just kind of scratched the surface so far we've we've uh we've looked at um let's see what well, we got leslie gore tommy james ernie harwell uh and uh, louis anderson and there's there's a ton more that you guys still have done yeah. yeah we were very fortunate and john and i both did a pretty good job of being able to elicit to these people or their publicists that we were truly fans and and interested and knew the history and so we were lucky to get people like art garfunkel and bj thomas and bobby goldsboro and bobby vinton and john the list certainly goes on and on yeah see the, the two that really strike me are, are um B.J. Thomas, right? Big fan of B.J. When I was, <laughs> that just didn't sound good when you yeah. say it that way. <laughs> just doesn't sound right. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, right. big fan of B.J. <laughs> Thomas, and uh, and also of uh, Johnny Rivers. You know, Whiskey Go Go. It was like the first albums I ever listened to were, you know, B.J. Thomas and, and and Whiskey Go Go with Johnny Rivers. You know, I always thought all those songs that Johnny Rivers was doing were his own songs. He wrote them, man. He must have wrote those songs. You know. Yeah. 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 I think one thing that probably john made us different than most people that they were stuck being interviewed by was that again we knew their past we knew exactly what their resume entailed and it came across in the interviews but john and i always had a completely different approach to the interviews in fact before we sat down together at the microphone ready to record somebody whether it was in person or a phone interview we never knew what the other person had set up for questions and in the last minute we might kind of create an order but I was always interested in the behind the scenes kind of stories and John was always really strong on the chronology of their history so the different approach made these people instead of maybe the 10 or 15 minutes that they thought they were going to give us last a lot of times longer than an hour and to find themselves enjoying the process yeah i found that you know i think i told you before oscar that if you got uh, an email or something if you could get to i, I had a, a fantastic luck with like their wives i mean if, if you got because usually their wives answer <laughs> hey, now. The, yeah, I, know, I, was, I was gonna say that too yeah what, what were you doing with the well, wives again? let me tell you <laughs> i was always left out of that process. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know usually you emailed them if they had an actual email yeah. and you'd find that the wives were the ones that were kind of keeping track of all that stuff yeah so yeah. they would be the ones that answer you and if you could kind of charm them a little bit 
you had them. Um, the, 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 the worst were, like I said, the publicists, the managers, because they were always looking at it, you know, hey, what's in it for us? Right. And, you know, like the... Uh, well, the Mac Davis story. The Mac you Davis, yeah, I the $10,000. $10,000. Yeah. $10, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I said, that's, that was just a little bit above our, uh, yeah, our uh, budget, yeah, wasn't it, Rick? John and I only had 8500 yeah. we'd have been glad to have <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. The good. other story, John, if you want to go the antithesis of that, was... The, the antithesis. Do you hear that one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right, right. I'm sorry. Go the ahead. wife of Earl Morrill was completely the other direction, and you had to get some good local help to get that great interview. Yeah, the the Earl Morrill uh, interview, which of course the great uh, Big Reds quarterback, and he had 20 years in the NFL. Um, I had uh, we had hooked up, and that became like a spy mission, like Mission Impossible, <laughs> because uh, I, I, I forgot how. I don't know who helped set that up. Actually, Dusty uh, Fairfield might have helped because Dusty's dad... Zipping a zipper again. Yeah, there he goes. <laughs> Dusty's dad. Dusty's dad. <laughs> We're going to hear him taking a leak hey, in a minute. you got to stay busy during this. <laughs> he's he's going to be like... Uh, what it's is actually it? my gun. gazebo, just so you oh, know. Okay, all right. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's what he calls it, by the way. That's what he's sticking <laughs> with. His, yeah. his gazebo. You know, he's got pet names. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's never been modest, old Rick Hickman. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, oh, Errol, yeah, that's right. So uh, Dusty had, had told me, so he says, yeah, you might want to get a hold of uh, Bob Hill, which was an old friend of Earl's, right? Right. So I got a hold of Bob Hill, and then Bob says, okay, I'll call, and uh, so vice versa. I mean, it, it la I mean, it took us probably three, four months to set that all up. And then when I talked to Dusty again, I, I said, hey, we got that all set up. He said, well, did you, and I forgot what his wife's name was, but he said, did you talk to such, and he said, I said, oh, man. He said, and he told the story of, he was, when Dusty first started coaching, he wanted Earl to come down for a quarterback camp, right? And uh, so he got a call, got the phone number, and he talks to his wife, and he says, hey, he says, you know, he says, I'm Dusty Fairfield, and he said, my, my dad, Bob, played in 51 Big Reds and all that stuff, and I, I just started coaching over here at Ravenna, and I'd like him to come down and, and run a, you know, be with me for a, a passing camp. And she says, "It's, it's $10,000 seems to be the uh, the magical sum. Because that was Matt Davis, and <laughs> yeah, that was also yeah. apparently his his figure, too. And she says, well, it'll cost you $10,000. And Dusty said, no, 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 you don't understand. He played the same, you know, he was my, my, he was my dad's friend. He actually babysat me when I was young. And she said, I don't care. It's going to still cost $10,000. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's why it's only $10,000. That's See, right. See, when John got Earl on the phone, he said, I can offer you $18 and two Fricano's pizzas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty high. That's pretty good. I would go for well, that. Well, yeah. that did the trick, apparently. But what a great interview, oh. because Earl was able to relate to what so many of our listeners lived through in the early part of his life playing in the gravel fields and obviously playing for a the junior high and the big reds in high school and going on to MSU and his recollection John wasn't it amazing it was great I mean he was telling you know third and long situations and I had uh, Terry Barr go out on a on a slam pass and I mean this is stuff like 1963 wow. and he's recounting it like it's day before yesterday which is kind of ironic because I think Alzheimer's is what eventually takes him and mm. robs you know robs him of of, of his mind mm. he was he was fantastic he had a, a dry sense of humor and uh it was, it was uh, you know, we really didn't have, did we, Rick? I mean, I'm trying to think. We really didn't have a bad interview. Everybody really stepped up to the plate and was, you know, was was just fantastic, weren't there? Was there anybody you can think of that? No, whether it was sports or entertainment, we were very lucky. And I think, if anything, our sincerity came through to these people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you talk about an interview that we were fortunate to land with Sparky Anderson. John and I were the last to ever interview Sparky. He had long since stopped giving interviews because his, rec his recall wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And obviously his health was waning rather quickly. But once we got into the mode, Sparky was just like the old Spark. And, uh, you know, he certainly hung out with us a long time. I remember he was like, well, how long do you want, man? And we said, well, you know, 30, 45. He's like, oh, my, oh my God. God. <laughs> so, you know, we agreed to like 10 or 12 minutes. And almost an hour later, he was still enjoying himself. And it was very, very meaningful 
to get a guy who is a hero to so many oh, yeah. and then it turning out to be his final yeah tiger baseball i mean if you're in michigan tiger baseball well you've got hey by the way you've yeah. got your hat and i brought my hat all too, right you got your tiger cap but Finally. i can't put it on. i got headphones on yeah. at the moment all right so i'll put it on after <laughs> but um <laughs> now i gotta ask you because i've got a, a few of them here that uh, that i want to play too um uh, like mark Lindsay. of course most people i mean i love the song arizona when he broke up with uh paul revere and the raiders and went off on his own he did but he didn't do much more than that he did like i think it was another, there was another one he had silver bird silver bird yeah and and i couldn't quite understand it because he had a great voice and and he did so, so well with paul revere and the raiders and that was one thing that was mentioned also in in uh, tommy james book about watching them you know play it as a band and all the tricks they would do with the guitars and you know that stuff so well, how did that interview go it went well i mean he was he was great um and rick yes, actually you saw paul revere without uh mark Lindsay, right right and you were talking yeah, about Paul revere it, simply had another guy come in live and uh, the drummer from chic was his drummer and i'll tell you what i sat by the speakers and holy cow you'd have thought it was led zeppelin i went home <laughs> feeling like i'd had a stroke then but it was such a blast because we wanted to get paul revere we would have loved to he died a little sooner than we were able to get to him yeah uh, some people are just willing to get out of interviews with us in the most drastic <laughs> right. ways that they yeah. possibly can right but Lindsay was so upbeat so informative in fact a lot of people don't realize because you mentioned oscar the two hits that he had as a solo artist but truly indian reservation may be the biggest hit uh that's uh, recorded by the raiders was actually him as a solo act contractually he oh. still had to put them on the record label but that was all him okay okay i didn't know that yeah that was him and the wrecking crew put that together and then like like rick said contractually he owed them one more song or something and it happens to be indian reservation oh. so how about that huh? yeah if you're a raider you're saying thank yeah, you <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> the one story he told i don't know if you remember this rick but he was talking about living in uh, california with uh, Terry Melcher, who was the son of Doris Day and was a was a uh, record producer back in the day, and he was going with Candace Bergen. Terry Melcher was at that wow. time, so he was kind of like the third wheel in this. In Candace this Bergen, oh, yeah, man. that's going back to the yeah. day, isn't it? Yeah. And they were living in this house, and uh, and uh, he talked about uh, Mark talked about this weird guy that would show up at the parties. They'd have these parties, and and uh, Dennis Wilson would bring him along, and he kind of sat in the corner. Charlie, and, and it was Charlie Manson, yeah, yeah. and. And uh, come to find out, you know, Terry uh, Melcher kind of said, didn't have any interest in recording him. He said, oh, this guy's really kind of a no talent. Mm -hmm. And if you fast forward about two years later, that very house, they wind up selling it to Roman Polanski okay. right. and to Sharon Tate. And they they figured the reason that Manson picked that house was he knew the floor plan. He he'd been in there. Right. He knew he knew what that was all about. So how spooky was that? Yeah, huh? yeah. how close that was. Yeah. So that so that one now now you know I got to tell you real quick when I back when I worked at the Hilton I DJed at the Hilton for I don't know five years or so, and there was a comedy act. They used to have comedy over there, comedy night. Mm -hmm. And there was one guy that came in there and he kind of did a little funny songs and did different things and I think he's name was Sean or something I, I'm trying to remember what his name was but he also played bass and he did this simple bass note and he was doing it over and over and he says yeah I played with Paul Revere and the Raiders for about four years and just playing this he uh -huh. said can you imagine just <laughs> just playing this bass note you know and I was like yeah okay but uh, yeah so that was that was the closest I got to Paul Revere and the Raiders was listening to a guy that filled in playing bass for him for wow. a while but but anyway, so that, that sounds like a great interview. I can't wait to hear it. Um, another one, too, uh, that I got a chance to meet that you guys uh, talked to was Mickey Dolenz yeah. uh, from the Monkees. Now, that was, I was another thing I was reading in uh, the Tommy James book. That book is very good. I mean, mm -hmm. it's got all kinds of information about the stars and everything that he met. And he mentioned the fact that the Monkees were getting more money than the Beatles and the Stones, at, you know, back in, what, 67, I think he said? I don't know why that surprises you. Well, 
yeah, I, I suppose. Yeah, I, you <laughs> know, these I mean, deadbeat Beatles, everybody. Slim Whitman outsold them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that was like, our, always our standard uh, joke. Yeah, Slim yeah, Whitman, Slim Whitman. <laughs> sold more more records than Elvis and the Beatles. What was the yeah. guy with the flu? What was this? Zampier. Zampier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> more than Elvis and the Beatles. Uh, man, he, what a bunch of dead what, weren't what those Ronco? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ronco, the amazing uh, Ronco. Sure, yeah, sure. Uh, no talent bums. Elvis anyway, and Beatles. Anyway, I told John the story last week. Is that Mickey Dolan's when I met him? Him, him and uh, Davy Jones and. Um, I think that was it. Just him and Davy Jones were in the in the lounge at, at the Hilton, and it was that was that was then. This is now was the song that came out. Oh at, yeah, sure. I was at Rock ninety five at the time, and I asked him to sign an autograph for me to all the guys at Rock ninety five. Well, he he did an autograph, and you couldn't read anything. It didn't say anything. It was just a couple of scribble lines he put down there. <laughs> but anyway, he was real nice and real friendly, and you know they had a good time at the bar. But I was just you know curious what. It what did you think of uh, Mickey Dolenz? Well, Mickey Dolenz and Peter Noon, since you mentioned him, had a shared history because they both started as actors at a very young age, were always in the public eye. That's right, that's right. So uh, yeah, I think Mickey was first or uh, might have been the guy that they built the monkeys around because he already had the acting chops. Does that sound about right, John? Yeah, he was in Circus Boy, that epic. Wasn't Davey uh -huh. like an Oliver or something? Davey was an Oliver, yeah, yeah. he was doing yep. Yep. Stage actor. Sure. Okay. So, so, so what did you think of, of Mickey then? Was he pretty... Well, Rick was a huge, and I was too, but Rick was like a lunch bucket huge monkeys fan, <laughs> yeah. weren't you? Weren't you? I, mean, I had the sweatshirt. <laughs> I had the monkeys puppets and pencils. Oh, yeah, my. Yeah, the lunchbox, the notebook. Yeah, I loved those guys. In fact, my punishment as a kid, it's not if I ever did anything wrong, was, hey, you can't watch TV for one day, three days a week, whatever it was. <laughs> well, that was okay, except it meant I had to miss the monkeys twice a week. So I would get on my little Schwinn. Uh oh. I think we lost him. I bet she's with his gazebo again. <laughs> <laughs> he got too excited about the monkeys. Yeah, that's right, yeah. 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 Uh, the sad part is he's still talking. You know that, don't you? Oh, probably, yeah. Are you, are you there? I'm here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I don't yeah. know what happened. You were with your gazebo again, weren't you? <laughs> I think a car drove by a mile away. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you're talking about Mickey, about the monkeys. Go ahead. Yeah, punishment, if I had ever been bad during the week, was that I had to miss TV for a day or three days or a whole week. And I could live with that, but it meant I had to miss the monkeys both times it aired during the week. So I would hop on my Schwinn bicycle with the butterfly handlebars and the banana seat. And I'd cruise around the block to this girl's house, and I would sit on the porch, and I'd watch through their front <laughs> screen door. And then I would, and when a commercial would start, I'd hop on my bike, ride around the block so my folks could see me again, and then scoot right back to her house to watch so I wouldn't miss an episode. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, that's I know. So they were on twice a week. Now, what, what days were they on? Do you remember that, I, too? I think it was Tuesday, Thursday. Tuesday and Thursday, okay. Yeah. Because there was, there was a night that we used to always go to, to, uh, play my my folks went to go play cards at my aunt's house, and there were three girls there that, uh, that are my cousins that live there, and they always had to watch the monkeys, and so that was one thing I had to do. I was stuck in there watching the monkeys, but then I got I got to like it, you know. I was I enjoyed it too, but I did not have the lunchbox or any of that other stuff. <laughs> yeah, I was just a huge fan of the. Uh... Oh, in fact, you remember the double-breasted shirts they made famous? They came in red and blue. No. <laughs> I had the red one. Yeah, they buttoned down both sides. They were kind of British looking. And it said wow. monkeys but, uh, with the guitar or something? It didn't say anything. It oh, was just oh. a plain shirt, but you knew it was a monkey shirt. <laughs> right, so. right. Back yeah. in the 60s, that was about as cool as wearing a Nehru jacket to grade school, which sure. I also had. Right, <laughs> right. But, uh, I, in fact, thinking back, I'm really shocked I did not get beaten up far more. Yeah. yeah. I, I deserved it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Mickey was a delight like i said we both loved it he was a guy that we were trying to get um we had talked really kind of i think he might have been the last member of the happy together tour that we finally were able to get because that was one that you didn't know if you could get him and finally we did 
I think everybody else put in a good word for us and he came on and he was a delightful interview and he we had just talked to him not too long after Davy Jones had passed away exactly oh, okay. so he he mm -hmm. talked about that and uh, that was kind of a shock too and yeah, yeah yeah it really was and uh, and then of course now we lost Peter so now you just got uh, oh, Mike Peter, I didn't know Peter was gone yeah he, he died a few years ago okay and so now you only got Mike, Mike was actually the one not nothing against Mickey I mean I love Mickey Mickey is you know but I always wanted to talk to Mike Nesmith yeah. because he was the one that always seemed to be kind of the the guy that wasn't necessarily bought into everything right. he was uh, he was kind of if you wanted to have a he was kind of the John Lennon of the group in terms of kind of the guy that uh, was uh, said what he what he thought he meant and stuff like that mm -hmm. and he was the one that really fought for their own music right and Rick and I have talked about this too and I think we kind of both agree on this I mean we loved Michael's stuff mm -hmm. but um, Mike kind of right from the start when uh, he had uh, Neil Diamond and Carol King and the Boyce and Hart writing all that stuff he didn't really go for that you mm -hmm. know he didn't really he, it was too poppy and all that stuff but the genius of uh, of all of that was that he, he when he lost those battles was they had this whole wealth of hits right I mean all these you know last trains of Clarksville I'm a believer blah 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 goes on and on and on well Mike was able to write his own stuff and it all had kind of that country feel to it or right. it was definitely different right. and I my argument is it kind of made it it, it put out the whole portfolio a little bit. I mean, you had the poppy stuff, and then you had Mike throwing in a song, and it just gave him an added depth. And if if I think if Mike would have had his way right from the beginning, and they would have backed off on some of the stuff that was hits for them, they it might not have been as as many hits as it, even though I liked it, but it wasn't yeah. it wasn't necessarily commercial. Well, you know the the first album that I I think it's I think it just says Stone Ponies, the Linda Ronstadt did the right were just Stone Ponies. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm, I'm that album there must have been four or five songs that were written by mike nesbeth yeah he actually wrote a uh, different drum and he'll sing a version yeah. of that yeah, yeah a different yeah. drum yeah it was uh, one of reverse tests and then joanne always like that was a, yeah. that was a solo hit by him but right. uh, yeah i always and now he's talking now that i don't have a radio show probably could get a hold of him now but he would be he would be he would be fun hey. to talk to you, you got it. You got an outlet right here. That's you want right. to get a hold of him? Give him a call. Okay, we'll, we'll do we'll that. We'll FaceTime him. We'll have to get uh, Rick over here too. Yeah, that's yeah, come be John in his bathroom, Rick in his gazebo, and Mike Nesbitt <laughs> somewhere on the West Coast. Right. Uh, all right. I'll tell you what was fun too is sometimes getting people a little off the beaten path from the classic hits, the oldies genre, or even the world of sports. We were able to interview Jerry Mathers, of course, oh, Bobby, Bieber, yeah, and Marie Osmond, and we were able to take both of those to some great depths. I think when you think of Jerry Mathers, you know, John kind of asked me, "Do you think we should do that?" And we were usually able to cultivate more out of something than we ever dreamed. And he was a wealth of information, wasn't he, John? Oh, he, he really was. And part of the Saturday morning jukebox, one of the things we did is we threw a lot of drops in. And I had, consequently, a lot of drops from Leave It to Beaver, Beverly Hillbillies. Mm. Uh, I'm hearing the no, song in my head right now. Yeah, all yeah. that stuff. <laughs> so I thought, you know, people are already acclimated to to that. And then uh, I said, so, and he was great. Uh, he, his only stipulation was he wanted to talk about uh, diabetes uh, because he was a he was a spokesman for that he okay. had that yeah and uh, he he really he says he's up he's I'll, I'll answer all your questions he says if you can just give me a few minutes to talk about you know the the importance to get checked and all this type of stuff I say hey that's no problem at yeah, all so yeah. so we did that we talked to Billy so Boomy. you fulfilled your PSA spot there yeah too. actually yeah. You, you're right yeah but he was great talked about Ken Osmond as uh, Eddie Haskell who was right. a Los Angeles police officer didn't know if you knew that or not yeah, yeah. Uh, actually got shot he did and uh, he said man what a stand up guy this guy was I mean he was nothing like the Eddie Haskell character yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. so uh, Bet she and the story of how Jerry was hired as the beaver because obviously these uh, cattle calls <laughs> yeah. for TV gigs you got hundreds of little boys showing up and John well remembers the story of how he got that role yeah exactly he uh, he he was called in for this audition and they had to go like two or three or four times him and his mother right and they got down to the final one, and uh, he was kind of fidgety because he had a Cub Scout meeting that night. 
And uh, so he fact, goes, didn't he go to the audition wearing his uniform? Yeah, yeah he wore his, <laughs> yeah, he wore it because he wanted, because she promised him the only way he would go to this audition was his mom promised him that right from the audition they would go to the Cub Scout meeting or whatever, the, the activity, whatever it was. And that's that was important to him, you know. And so he goes through it and, and you know, he's kind of half into it, Jerry is, you know, and the, the, uh, the director or the producers, whoever it was, says, hey, Jerry, you just don't seem to have the pep in all. He said, well, I got a Cub Scout meeting at 6 o'clock and it's getting kind of close to that. And, and so the guy says, well, fine, go to the Cub Scout meeting. So he comes out and his mother is just beside herself because Jerry just walked in and these guys left, you know, and she said, well, what are you doing? That's, he said, well, I told him I wanted to go to a Cub Scout meeting. And so she thought that obviously he blew it, right? Right. And he says they get a call a couple of days later. And it was from uh, from the, the producers, one of the producers. And he says, hey, he says, just want to let you know Jerry got the part. And she said, well, I was really concerned when he left early to go to the Cub Scout meeting. He says, well, he did great in all of his other things. He said it was kind of a foregone conclusion. But he said the whole point of Beaver Cleaver to us was we wanted a kid that would care more about going to a Cub Scout meeting yeah. than being an actor. Right. And he said that was the reality of it. So mm -hmm. that's that's what actually sold them the final nail in the coffin, if you will, of what got uh, yeah. Jerry Mathers as a beaver. Imagine that, huh? So next time anybody goes to an audition, they should <laughs> say, I want to go to a Scout. Yeah. It's going to look a little bit old uh, for uh, any of us three to try to pull that off now. <laughs> well, <laughs> We'd plus probably now some that they're time. running all of those lawyer commercials on TV about the Scouts, <laughs> yeah. it yeah, might that's not right. be the best thing for yeah, a 60-year-old guy. Be no. <laughs> Probably not. Hey, little boy, come yeah, over here. Yeah, yeah. Oh. You know, and we, I mentioned Marie Osmond. Nobody could have guessed how funny she is, how lighthearted, and even a little naughty. Yeah, yeah. I would had a major crush on her when she, oh, you know, was doing the Donnie Marie reason. show. Oh gosh, yeah, man. She was, she was such a little hottie back then. And then you even inter interviewed a, a gal that was on Bandstand. Remember that, Rick? Arlene Sullivan. Yeah, she brought oh, her was one yeah, of the yeah. bandstand dancers. Now, most of us have a background where we can remember how important American bandstand was to the landscape of America. And to, again, those behind the scenes kinds of stories that I always like. You can ask about Dick Clark, the other dancers. Mm -hmm. What were the rules? How did they become a dancer? It was just fascinating. Oh, yeah. The uh, buddy of mine, uh, Paul, Paul Phillips, who goes by Peter Tripp, the curly-headed kid in the third row. <laughs> he, uh, he when he was in the Army, he uh, or in the Navy, rather, he actually was in at a bandstand and he was one of the dancers and i'm thinking this guy could not dance i'm thinking <laughs> that way, had to be one terrible dance day i'm sure he didn't get any camera time but anyway yeah uh, but he he told me a little bit about that too and he you know he he said dick clark was a great guy and and anyway but yeah uh dick clark was also in this book about you know with we were talking about that too with with alan free oh the payola thing the right? payola yeah, thing yeah right, right. so that was that was kind of because I was kind of looking into the whole Alan Freed thing, too, and, and uh, a lot of different things about Alan Freed, and that kind of cleared it up a little bit more, too. Yeah. You know, Rick, when, when we would do it, uh, we would uh, when we would uh, come up with an idea for uh, who to talk to, usually Rick was busy working, so I would come up, I'd have the, the time on my hands to say, hey, well, how about if we talk to this guy? Yeah. And Rick's like, yeah, that's, that sounds great. And what was neat was, remember the Art Garfunkel interview? Um, that, that was one that we didn't really set up. Art had just, I, I told you the story, right. Oscar, where he had he'd come out with this album. And uh, and so we actually got, it was a cattle call situation. You were only going to get 10 minutes. And we, you know, we knew we'd, we'd like at least 20. But and he was coming to Muskegon. So we were lucky from that standpoint, exactly. coming to Frauenthal. Yep, exactly. And so, um, but we knew we only had him for 10 minutes. And I had heard that he doesn't talk about, it depends how, we, uh, how the wind's blowing if he talks about Paul Simon or not. Right. You know, there are times that he does times that he doesn't and i remember rick and i we were talking and we talk about the song the sound of silence right that that song and all of a sudden he goes on about it and then he says paul simon great songwriter let's talk about him and i remember rick and i looked at one another and it was like the <laughs> thumbs up like it's like holy cow it just fell right in. but again i think Hit it gets the mother back, load yeah it yeah. kind of gets back to what rick was saying is he was he knew that uh, you know he had a couple 
couple of guys we knew enough about some stuff and he knew that you know you got to think that these guys and a regular average interview i mean they're they're talking to a lot of people that don't even really appreciate who they are know what they are know what their history or anything like that right. so i think what happens is when they get you know a couple of Stooges that uh, that actually Larry and Mo yeah, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Shemp or Curly <laughs> I'm not sure which ones yeah that that actually know what what they were about I mean they actually appreciate it and uh, and I remember that that interview ended way too soon it was and he would have talked Rick right Rick he would have talked probably another he would have been a, a full hour for us I mean we did turn him into that with the music but I mean he would have he would have given us just story after story after what story did he tell you this, any story about the boxer when they did the boxer uh, he didn't but I do know the story. Yeah, about yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I, I saw him on, I think it was like Johnny Carson or something. We yeah. talked about that yeah. and said that Paul Simon was just crazy because he had to go to a cathedral right. and record himself in different areas of the cathedral to get the get the, the echo, sound. echo. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, and, and I'm thinking, wow. Hal Blaine was the drummer on that. You heard the Hal Blaine story, oh, yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah. Where he said they set themselves up because the echo was just perfect in front of the elevator. And he says, as the, you know, like the da da da, bam, when he's hitting the drum. Yeah. <laughs> he says just then the uh, elevator doors are opening and there's an, about an 85 year old security guard and he says he hits the drums he goes pow as the doors open he said that guy just acted like he'd just been shot like, he said man he said he said he thought he killed him I think one of the things that Art appreciated was our take on the success failure of them as a as a duo of course starting out earlier as Tom and Jerry evolving into Simon and Garfunkel and having just such legendary hits and albums and they're really kind of iconic to the 60s as a group they were of course yeah. at Woodstock and so many other great things and we related that uh, just like marriage a lot of times people are married 20 25 30 years and then there's a breakup and people are like oh that's a failed marriage was it they were together so long successfully yeah. the same thing like this music duo it's simply that you evolve and you decide to move on to other projects how dare somebody say that was a failure mm -hmm. Right. I agree. And I think he appreciated that slant on it. Maybe I hadn't even thought of it that way. Right. You know, I I, uh, I saw over at the, um, the Playhouse over here, White Lake Playhouse, they had a, Beth Beeman had brought in uh, two guys that were from, I think they're from England, somewhere in England, but um, they didn't look like or sound like as far as talking anything like Simon and Garfunkel but when they sang together oh, wow. um, it was unbelievable I thought I finally got to see Simon and Garfunkel because yeah. those two were just amazing and anyway the, the funny part about it was was the guy who was playing the guitar he's trying to sound ex exactly like Paul Simon and he says he's worked very hard to sound like Paul Simon and everybody gave major applause for the other guy who was playing Garfunkel that did the whistle yeah, yeah. <laughs> he did the whistling, and everybody stood up like, "Oh man, that whistle was yeah. awesome!" It's like man, I, I spent hours yeah. trying to get the guitar like Paul Simon. But and now you know why Simon and Garfunkel broke up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you what: if you're a duo and you're doing a tribute band to Simon and Garfunkel, oh. that's saying something. John and I have been offered a similar gig, but they wanted us to be a tribute band for Bob Dylan and Willie right. Nelson. <laughs> so, John, not the quite the same love. accolades. Yeah, no, exactly. There you go. Yeah, well, you never know. I mean, you know, it, it, it might work out. You know, yeah, I, I'm a big Bob Dylan fan, so yeah. and Willie. Um, another guy I want to talk to you about. One of my favorites from the from the '60s, uh, Gary Puckett. Mm. Now, what was that one like? Is he still alive, by the way? Yes, he is. He is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he was. He was uh, great to talk to as well. That told the the stories about, uh, um, you know, the the Union Gap was a band, but again, he was a. a yeah, I think there was a lot of Wrecking Crew stuff. So it was kind of like, yeah, you had bands that right. went out on the road and stuff like that. But yeah, he was. Uh, he had a. I think it was 1968, wasn't it, Rick? That he had like the year of years. I mean, he was like the. I think the artist of the year or something like that. And uh, they were everywhere and bless them because 1968 was my youthful summer of awful i was uh sheltered away at this non-existent ghost town in arkansas during the year of the Detroit Tigers, can you imagine being oh, yeah, one of the biggest fans? Yeah. And I'm kidnapped and taken to Arkansas for three months. And Gary Puckett and the Union Gap was the hottest thing on Top 40 radio. And God bless him, it got me through that summer. Huh? Yeah. 
Right, and and he was yeah, he was fantastic. That was a parental kidnapping, by the way. It wasn't like somebody. Just <laughs> it was, yeah. but it was still harsh. Right. Yes. Was, yeah. 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 We and, want you to uh, build a gazebo yeah. <laughs> in Arkansas. That's right. Yeah. There's You're coming with us to tonight. Do there, but sweat. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> all there is to do in Arkansas. And then you know Gary invited us down to see a show, which was right. amazing because think of some of their big hits and those really high notes that Gary had to hit. Yeah. And was he already? 60 plus years old he John? was he was yeah he was uh he oh. was knocking the heck out of yeah the 60s uh never and, lost a note no he really didn't hmm. and he told a story about like a religious experience he used to be he was kind of caught up in that whole eastern religion thing in the 60s that a lot of artists were and he was going to meditate and all of a sudden he said this i and i i uh, if you play the interview, he'll tell the story much better than I will. Because, but it, but it was all of a sudden it was um, it, he heard what a uh, voice actually pretty much set him straight on that. Hey, you know, like this is he, I, he, he's like I said, he actually tells the has the story in there, and I can't remember, but he actually hears what is the voice of God telling him that uh, you know you're <laughs> get off this stuff and get get with me, and he did, and he says, man, he says that was just uh, it was it was amazing. It was an amazing rebirth for him. He said, so "Yeah, I thought that was excellent." What now? Um, this is one guy that I actually interviewed during. I told John about this too. Um, I interviewed him when uh, I was interviewing the Turtle Lake nudist colony, <laughs> and they had nude stock uh, every year. I remember it well. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Randy Bachman. Um, to me, he was a great guy, and I never could understand because everybody always, always said that he was the one that uh, broke away from the guests who because he couldn't get along with you know with uh, Cummings, yeah. and he's the one that broke away from uh, BTO because he couldn't get along with his brothers or he couldn't get along with Turner. And I'm thinking, man, this to me, this guy was awesome. I when I talked to him, he, he seemed like such a nice guy. Yeah, and he was. He was. He was truly a, a nice guy. I, I think the 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 way he told the story with. Uh, um, the breakup of the Guess Who was he was a uh, you know he's a rock and roller but yeah. he doesn't do drugs and he doesn't get caught up in that lifestyle and Burton Cummings was the opposite of that okay. Burton was having alcohol drug problems all this type of stuff and their battles were a lot over that he said you know he said I was too straight for him and he was just too out there and wild uh, for, for me and he says that's, yeah. that's exactly kind of what happened but no he was great and you know what's cool about him is he has he has I don't know if still, but at the time we talked to him, he still had his own radio show. He had a satellite radio show, yes. which pretty much he did what Rick and I and you with Talking Tunes do. Um, it just kind of tell the stories uh, from the artists. And, you he's know, been doing a lot of Facebook stuff, too, as yeah. far as that goes. Yeah, he's very social that way. And yeah, uh, yeah he was just, uh, he was, he was just a, a, a great guy to talk to. There was, I can't remember the name of the program, but I think it was on Prime. But uh, he did a show, and it was just like in, in Canada. And he was just sitting in Canada with the guitar. And at first, it started just him explaining every one of the hits that he had written. Right. I don't know if you've you seen that. Huh. No. Yeah. It was. It's, I think it's on Prime. But anyway, he he goes through each one of the hits that he has written through right. uh, the early age, the early stage before Burton Cummings even. Oh. And he explained how you know uh, all these different songs came along with with the guest who American Woman, and yeah. Laughing, and then he also went on to you know the BTO as far as some of the songs he. I remember I insulted him though, <laughs> and he, he still just kind of brushed it off, but he didn't really say much. I said to him, I said, when I was you know when I was a kid, I I wanted to play the bass, so I was learning how to play the bass. And one of the songs on the Not Fragile album was Not Fragile, and on Not Not Fragile you heard that did that bass heavy bass going on, and I said, man, I love that song, and he said, yeah, okay, and it was Turner that wrote it, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oops yeah. well and then you know he was an accordion player and yeah. he would write songs like some people write to keyboards he would write for the accordion, accordion. yeah because they had the same notes and stuff like that that's what, what was it was it uh, These Eyes yeah. the whole of, dun, 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 dun. he says I actually played that on the accordion and that was uh, and he actually he sent me a, a CD um, that he had done with Neil Neil Young yeah and, they were and they, it's like yeah and it's like uh, it would never be on radio because it was like 13 minutes long it was like Neil, him and Neil Young just jamming on the guitar and I'm thinking 
this is so cool, and I have no idea what happened. Well, it's like blue collar. I mean, he goes on that whole riff. I mean, he's yeah. you know, kind of a you know, kind of a jazz guitarist too. Yeah. I mean, he's really you know he's not just a hard rock and thumping guitarist. Yeah. I mean, he's because he's not really as too much of a singer. No, Bacher, no. But yeah, his, right. his his writing and his his good his guitar sure. work. Yeah. But anyway, I'm sorry. That was my that was my look at yeah. Randy. What what did you guys find out? Well, pretty much the same. Uh, I mean, it was, well, then it's going to be a boring interview here. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, for one, he's Canadian, so it's a given that he's wonderful and nice. Right, right. <laughs> That's true. That's true. If you're Canadian, you got to be nice, right? Right. <laughs> but yeah, same so with you. So, after, let us no, ask young. you a question. Okay. If there was somebody on your Mount Rushmore of wish lists of famous artists to interview, who would be? Who would it be? Um, well, a buddy of mine got to interview. He's of course he's 81 years old now, but uh, he got to interview Elvis Presley. I thought that had been kind of an interesting interview. Wow! Well, yeah, uh, hard to beat that. Yeah. But what I was going to ask That'd you be kind of quiet interview right now. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plus it's uh, a long drive to Kalamazoo. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Another guy, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, another guy that's gone that I would have loved to talk to would be Rick Nelson. I always yeah. thought Rick Nelson stuff. I like his early stuff, of course, in the 60s. But I actually liked Rick Nelson when he came back in the 70s. Garden Party album i thought that was a great album i, I love the album he played some old chuck berry stuff on it yeah he had, yeah it was just a good album i thought you know we talked to his son gunner and gunner did it i mean and it was all based around that's, ricky yeah you did tell and me that, that was yeah. a fantastic interview because we wanted to plan that's one thing that we did with these interviews is we well, uh, do have a gunner guy we do have gunner yeah. nelson here so and that, yeah that, i would recommend that one too because he talks uh, it's all it's not about him it's about yeah. his dad because him and his brother were doing a tribute to to their dad yeah. and he tells the story about uh just different stories on how it all started out how ricky became a <laughs> became a singer imagine this you're ricky nelson you're a good-looking kid i mean you're on television anyhow mm -hmm. and that's not enough to get girls apparently because he, all of a sudden he he goes into music because he wants girls and elvis really? El, yeah elvis <laughs> presley yeah i mean that's like i think man so he couldn't get enough girls huh. you know just being ricky nelson but uh that's what that's what got him going and the heartbreaking story remember if this one Rick is when uh, Gunner was telling about his uh, uh, how he found out that his dad was was killed in a in a plane crash. Remember that? Yeah, I do. And and how they even learned about it, right? Because uh, they learned about it the way most of us did from radio. Oh yeah, yeah. Him and his buddies are out cruising around, and all of a sudden they're starting they're they're you know they're playing a little radio roulette, and all of a sudden hey, there's a Ricky Nelson song, and then there's another one, and then there's another one. Is wow, you know? And and Gunner's trying to figure out you know what the occasion is because it's not dad's birthday it's not this you know, and then all of a sudden the disc jockey says very sad news we've learned of course we're having a tribute to ricky nelson killed in a plane crash tonight and so how do wow you, that's that's how you find out your that's dad terrible. died yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's yeah. terrible how they do that just like a, a basketball -like player i can't think of his name that just passed away um oh kobe Bryant. kobe Bryant. how they announced it before the yeah. family even knew that it was yeah. just it's just just wrong right well you think the way that it was when we were growing up it was was always okay we're going to wait till the next of kin are notified with right. social media that will never happen again right yeah. right yeah that's true that's true they'll tell you you're dead before you're actually dead now that's, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. kind of how i got out of radio they told me i was dead before I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> they said everybody that of us got that same. Hand, said, not so fast Russell. <laughs> <laughs> you're in radio what really <laughs> <Yeah>. still <laughs> what is that uh, um yeah, but the, another one will be, will be Three Dog Three Dog Night. Um, I always loved them. Uh, Steve Perry. I mean, I've got a list that yeah. would go on and on. I we, mean, we did talk to you know what? I, Chuck Negron. I, thank you. Right from the Three Dog Night. It yeah. took Rick in here to get me to remember. I mean, I knew I couldn't remember Chuck's name for goodness sakes. Yeah, but for, yeah. First band I got to introduce was Three Dog Night, but it was kind of like not really the introduction. You know how they did it, Heritage Landing. You, yeah. you oh, kind of yeah. talked about it. You know, they're coming up next, and then you you know yeah, go away yeah, and yeah. ten minutes later. That, they were yeah. kind of afraid that you were going to actually introduce somebody. Yeah, that? Yeah, was like, yeah, yeah. Here, you can introduce them, but by God, don't don't, don't you introduce, introduce them. them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we need Tim and Tom to do 
that. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so crazy. Talk about the Red Cross and about this and that. No, talk about it. Talk about it. So here I was. Food I was, for Cambodia. My very first one, and I'm so excited. I'm going to introduce Three Dog Night. And I didn't even get a chance to talk to him, meet him, anything. Right. You know. Yeah. You know. Anyway. <laughs> so that, that would be kind of a kind of a thing. Alice Cooper. I'd love to talk to Alice Cooper. Yeah, he was on our list. We didn't quite get to him. Yeah. Chuck Negron was actually a, a, a basketball player. I mean, he was like a hot shot basketball yeah. player. Yeah, yeah, college. Yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah, he talked about very candidly about his battle with with drugs and and at that time the, they all had a battle with drugs. I think didn't so. They? Yeah, and the, the other two got together, but they didn't want him to be a part. <laughs> and, and the thing it had to be deeper than this, but his excuse was <laughs> the reason was they didn't want to split the money three ways. Oh. You know, I mean, they already got it split two ways. Yeah, they just didn't want to split it three ways. When I introduced it, it was just the two of them. Which yeah. is two. I don't remember which two. But uh, there's Denny like two and of somebody them. else. Denny and uh, yeah, it wasn't the wasn't the guy with the mustache? I can that, no, that's that's Negro. That's Negro. Okay, and and he's actually kind of the voice of all yeah, that. Pretty much, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. All right. Eli's so, coming, and and Mama Mama told me not to come. I think he did right. all those. Didn't Black he? and white. Sure, joy to the world. Joy yeah. to the world. Joy to the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, I and tell a bunch you what, of good songs too. Just, <laughs> just the two of them though sounded great. Yeah, I mean they really did. Now right. I guess there's only one touring, which I have no idea who it is. It's probably Chuck. Could yeah, be. Chuck. Uh, he is. He has to formally be known legally as Chuck Negron, formally of yeah, Three Dog Night. Oh, okay. I know. Isn't that something? Yeah, that's what we were talking about that too. As far as like, <laughs> like Claire John Fogarty, John C-C-R, Fogarty. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can't even use CCR. Creedence Clearwater Revisited. Yeah. I remember. And Brian Wilson can't be a Beach Boy anymore. Yeah, yeah. That's like yeah. wow. Holy cow. Of course, I'm not sure anybody, of, any of us, really want Brian to be a Beach Boy yeah, anymore. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I heard him say, "God uh, uh, was a." David Letterman, he put an album out and he came on and it was yeah. like, okay, Brian, yep, yep, you were you were a genius, but you had too many drugs, yeah. too many drugs, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the same as it was, sure. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so yeah, there's, there's a ton of them and I could I could go on and on about that. Um, you know, the fact that all of these great singers had all these drug problems has always mystified me because wouldn't the girls be enough? Yeah, you would think so, wouldn't you? Yeah, <laughs> but it's it's not. Maybe that's what they need to keep awake. I don't know. I just yeah. have to, yeah. Oh, maybe that was it. I mean, it was before Viagra. Yeah, sure. yeah there you go. Right. Keep going. Um, the Ventures. Now that's that had been a cool. Way. Now who did you? Don Wilson. Okay. Yeah. Now he was what the? He was the. He, he was, wasn't a lead singer because no, was, wasn't no. singing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't <laughs> singing in the Ventures. So. Yeah. He was uh, the founder along with uh, Nuki uh, Noki. Uh, What's Nookie? Nookie. <laughs> Nookie, Nookie. 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 Uh, God, yeah. I forgot what Nookie's last name was. But, uh, yeah, they co-founded it. And he, yeah, he was a great, uh, he was a, another guy told all the stories yeah. about, you know. And, and they hit back in the days in the 60s. You remember live radio back then was you had to hit the news at the top of the hour live. And it was usually a network feed. So you'd have to back time. And so all of a sudden, instrumentals became, like, really big. For, right. You know, because guys oh, yeah. back then couldn't back time. KBZ, time. when they worked at KBZ. Yeah. Yeah. to get the top of the REI, you know, the ID and, of yeah. course, the, the news. I remember Stan oh, yeah. Wallace loved him a lot in WTRU, but he apparently couldn't back time for diddly squat because yeah. you'd be here in the four seasons. Let's hang on, girl, the one, you know. Yeah, and all fade of a sudden, out. Yeah, all of a sudden, yeah. Or it wouldn't even <laughs> dun, fade. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, yeah, he's like, man. So that's why, you know, and that's what happened to them is instrumentals yeah. came in, and then you could, that was a more, you know, it was an easier fade, fade out yeah, and yeah. instrumental. And, yeah. and John Dunn was a drummer, wasn't he? No, he was the, he was the lead guitarist. Uh, yeah, okay. I actually what, what what was confusing there was I got set up through the drummer through the drummer's wife because uh, yeah. the drummer had died. <laughs> of but, course, yeah, but uh, yeah, but you know me and my magic with the women of, of the groups. <laughs> I, uh, John was always a hit with the women the like stud. the equipment. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, got you uh, stud you. Got uh, Mel Taylor's wife and uh, we uh, yeah, no, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry. The drummer, yeah. So all of a sudden I had uh, I got Don Wilson through her. Now now the Ventures, they always had great album covers too. Yeah. If you remember a they bunch had, of girls, always had girls, yeah. yeah right. Girl, very girls in very slinky outfits. Sure. I See, they didn't girls. need drugs. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But they had some great, they're great tunes too. And I mean, they did a lot of stuff that Herb, Herb Albert did too. I mean, right. they redid that and did it, you know, really well. The one story that Don told uh, that was when Walk Don't Run came out, they needed $50. I mean, they had raised all the money, but they needed $50 for something else. Just to kind of finish the deal. Hmm. And he asked his dad. 
and he said, hey, could you lend us $50? He says, not only will I not lend you the $50, but you better have your, you better, you're not going to have your mother going around to different radio stations and trying to hawk, because his mom was, you know, their, their mom, the manager. His mom was kind of the manager oh, okay. of taking us to radio stations. Hey, this is my kid, you know, would you play his stuff? He says, we're not having that anymore. And uh, yeah, so for $50, $50, I mean, they wound up coming up with it, but he's, he said, you can have a piece of it for 50 bucks, you know, yeah. whatever, you know, no, I ain't going to do that. Man. You know, that was one thing I noticed, too, about Tommy James' uh, book is that he's in a windstorm now, I guess. Yeah, Rick is. The, the, the gazebo. Actually, uh, the neighbors have chickens. <laughs> they prefer my property. <laughs> yeah. so That's why he built chickens. the gazebo. He does live yeah, in Hooterville. They have two feigning goats, and the other side, I have two horses, two dogs, and five goats. <laughs> so the sounds that come out of here are not bodily, just so you know. <laughs> Just want to clarify that uh, at my late age. That's why Rick says, "Back off, back <laughs> off." <laughs> he always says that. <laughs> oh, there's a guy I would have would have loved to interview is Roy Clark. I was oh, a big yeah. Roy Clark Funny fan. Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talent. Yeah, very talented. Yeah, it was what a guitar player, man. Oh, that yeah. guy could play just about anything. Ben Skill, another great guitar player. Ben you Skill, know, yeah. He's now part of the Eagles. Now. Yeah, yeah. If, so. if anybody hasn't seen Vince Gill in person, I would suggest uh, that they do. And John's got an even better Vince Gill story. Yeah, sweet, uh, sweet story about that. Uh, it was um, we had a, a band around here, and it was we won a Battle of the Bands contest, and we got a chance to be the opening act. I don't think it was called the Froenthal then. It was probably called whatever it was before the Froenthal. The, the Stripperama. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it was but, always a Froenthal. But, but anyway, yeah. well, was it maybe? I thought well, it was Cherry County Playhouse. They did. They considered. Yeah, that but I thought for it was something else before. I mean, this would have been back it in the 70s. Have been. I don't know. Well, pure, pure, yeah. oh, 70s. pure, pure okay. Prairie League is just right, coming in, right? right? So the, the deal was you could open for Pure Prairie League if you won this battle, and we did. And so okay. we opened for them. And anyhow, at the end of the gig, you know, we were watching the show and all this stuff, so we're putting our stuff away in the alley behind there. And I've got the drum kit and all this stuff, and I'm putting it in the <laughs> in my van, and all of a sudden this guy says, hey, you need some help. And I said, yeah. I said, I could always use some help. And it was it was Vince Gill. Vince Gill of course, yeah. he wasn't Vince Gill. Vince Gill, you know what I mean? I mean, it was yeah, pure, it was, well, was pure pearly. He well, kind of stepped in yeah. as the lead singer because the other guy decided he wanted to do it anymore. Right, exactly. Yeah. But I mean, he wasn't like the Vince Gill of no, today. You no, know what I mean? I mean, right. he was just, just a long-haired kid from Kentucky right. and just the sweetest guy and and everything today that you see him on the award show I mean that when you see him talk that's him I mean that's right. not, you know that's not any made up stuff I mean, well, the just thing a, he does with uh, with uh, Carrie Underwood when they um, How Great Thou Art I don't know if you've ever seen that on, on YouTube but that that always blew me oh, away oh okay yeah but yeah I, I, now Vince Gill um he was one of the first country acts that I saw, I think, when I was worked at MUS back in 1990. Right. It was George Jones who started the show because he was considered no-show Jones. <laughs> so he, he started the show. <laughs> yeah. And then it was Vince Gill in the center. And okay. then Conway Twitty ended the show. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I got to meet Vince and I got to meet my my idol, George Jones. You know, yeah. I, yeah, I just love the guy. Did George know who you were? Oh, God, no. <laughs> Did, no. You know Did George who, know who he was? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Did he know who he was? Yeah. <laughs> That's the bigger question. No, he he was hard to get because he like he went like as soon as he got done he was like looking for drinks. Gone. Maybe. No. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, so Vince, but Vince Gill, I mean, that's when I got to know how talented the guy was. And uh, Conway Twitty, he didn't talk to anybody. But uh, you know, he was kind of big time. And he was, yeah. Well, you know, a lot of times he kept his back to the audience. I'm thinking, what's well, that yeah, all about? Yeah. You know. Wow. And later I see an, uh, um, some article about him saying something about. He's being more with the audience because he found out they like that better now or something. And I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah, they like this. They this is like 1990. Yeah. I mean, he'd been around for since what the 60s or the yeah. 50s. I think yeah, it was. I know. Yeah, they you like know. Now see that works if you're Luke Bryan. The audience does like it. Yeah, yeah they like it. Yeah. At least the female half of yeah, the audience. My, my wife always likes his butt. Yeah. I said, yeah. but, but it's singing. Come on. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the singing butt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, um, so okay, anyway, I, I look kind of lost track of where we were, but I were we talking? Oh, we were talking about the ventures, weren't we? <laughs> yeah. <I think. laughs> All right. So I don't know. Do you want to talk about? We've got uh, Brian McLe McLe. 
Oh, the hockey player? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about a sport, your sports guys? I mean, you guys know about that. I'm not a big... Yeah, I mean, in general, obviously, between John and certainly Cal Van Single with all the football, basketball broadcasts, they know virtually everybody <laughs> locally that's ever had anything to do with sports, and they have a great rapport, <laughs> and obviously, they Dying. lent a whole lot to the Muskegon area sports scene. Yeah, Brian was on the first team here in Muskegon, and, uh, you know, was really a, a part of the, the pioneer of all that stuff, so <laughs> talked about uh, his, his career both up in Canada. I mean, he's like one of those guys that you heard the stories of the old Canadian guys where they were playing on the ponds and all that type yeah. of stuff back in the day, and he told all of those stories. And, of course, I was a big fan of the, the Mohawks in the 60s. I'm hearing up. chickens behind my ear. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A kid that grew up in Detroit. I never predicted it would end I like know, this. that's yeah. right, yeah. The country uh, life, yeah. What have I done wrong? But, uh, yeah, Brian told well, all hey, the I, stories. I moved to the country, too. I mean, I, I grew up in the Mount Clemens area, so that's Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oscar's a Detroit area kid, too. Yeah, so you guys so. would hit it off. Yeah, this is Green Acres. I'm telling you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, and I'm Eddie Albert, believe me. <laughs> I'm the one that's lost. Yeah. Hey, you're married to Zsa Zsa. So yeah. <laughs> New York is where it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. So as far as now, did, I was going to ask you then about Terry Ficarelli. Now, did you did you guys talk to him at all much? I mean, I would love Thousands to talk to Terry times. again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We talked to yeah Terry will call us and then we'll we'll talk to him too. Yeah, yeah. Terry. He's Terry. still in the area. Yeah, Terry. No, I think he he moved out now. But no, he's he's still is here. He back because yeah. I like to talk to him too and put him on talking to because oh you should get a hold now, of Terry him. and I go back to the KBZ days when he first came yeah, here right. when he very first came here and he demanded this and he demanded that and I'm wow. thinking what what do you want I was a program director there yeah. at that time yeah and he was demanding all this stuff and I'm thinking who the heck is this guy you know yeah. the other guy phone line he was a happy camper you know wow but not not Terry he wanted ISDN line he wanted all this stuff you know so at first him and I didn't yeah kick didn't it get off. along real well yeah. but yeah we became very good friends after that yeah and, he would and, do it Terry was always interested because he, he didn't care if we were necessarily on the air. He would call us, especially after he got lucky, and he'd go, I put a biscuit in the bag! <laughs> he said, I just wanted somebody to know. Uh, yeah, great, uh, you know, over what, some of the stories, 3,000 games or something. Yeah, some yeah. of the stories yeah. that he had when Executive. he was on, on the bus, too, that what the yeah. guys would do to this poor guy. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. He was a very good sport about that, that's for sure. sure. Well, we yeah, and we just well. Lost. Terry went to bed wearing a three-piece suit and a tie. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he also had his, his special toothpicks too. You ever you ever see a special toothpicks that he pulls out of his pants when he gets done uh, eating? <laughs> <laughs> that one didn't come out right, did it? Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it did come out, yeah. but anyway, anyway, Thomas and toothpicks out of his pants. <laughs> Wait a minute here. No, but he had his own special mint-flavored toothpicks or something. He'd, he'd pull them out and he'd say, "Hey, you want one?" It's like, "Nah, I'm good." Yeah. good Terry. <laughs> just have to pull but, it out of his pants. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've got a new one here somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, these were encased and everything. Oh, okay. But anyway, right, yeah. yeah. But anyway, so he would, he would, you know, right after we got done eating, because we go out and eat lunch and we talk about the game and what you know what we needed to do or what do we needed to change. And and uh, after lunch, man, he'd take these toothpicks on and he'd be picking his teeth and he'd be like stuff flying all over the table. You know, he'd be dodging, <laughs> you know, sure. his lunch. You know, yeah. and uh, but yeah, he's the one that gave me the name and I always loved it that he gave me the name. Uh, um, no, I forgot the name. <laughs> <laughs> the man who put the all in radio, he oh, said. Oh, so that was always cool. Oh, that was cool. Yeah. yeah, he yeah. always had names for everybody. So. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I got to talk to him again because he was he was a lot of fun. Yeah, he, of fun. he was really good. Uh, the story about it wasn't his story. It was actually Eric Nadell who is now in the, down with the Texas Rangers uh, doing their games. Mm. He told a story. We just lost Moose Lalo here a couple of weeks ago. Mm. Passed away, and uh, he told a Moose Lalo story. And Moose apparently. Mm fractured the the language a little bit i mean he was uh, so they were they were oh, playing terry, terry figarelli had his own fictionary so yeah, there you go <laughs> You're absolutely right, yeah. but i guess there's some place i, I want to say dayton or maybe even out in des moines or something like that and they're getting ready for a game and and they wanted to, he wanted everybody to meet back at the bus at a certain time so he says and they, they were in a different time zone now so he said okay everybody everybody this is important everybody simonize your watches right now 
Yeah, <laughs> instead of synchronize. Simonize your watch. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, Simonize. They still make that? I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> that was like an old, what, old commercial that, uh, that you, was Larry for, Hardy did or something. That was for like that. washing your vehicles, wasn't it? Yeah, Simonize. yeah, Simonize. Turtle wax. Yeah, like turtle wax. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so what do we got here? We've got uh, Fran, T- Fran Tana. Frank Tanana. 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 Yeah. Thank you. You, you said it's that like just banana, like the guy that sat next to him at Cal's lunch. Right? Yeah, well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, Cal had a had a lunch and uh, and this guy was one of the things was if you were a big bidder at he did this auction for charity Cal did okay for, for his religious group and he had this guy sat next to, t- to Frank and had no idea who Frank was and I said man isn't that the isn't that the way it goes it's like the guys you go to a World Series game and you're a guy that's went to all the games and all of a sudden the big shots have the the great seats and they don't even know who anybody is and here this guy sat next to Frank Tanan and has no idea who he is you know? <laughs> I I don't have any idea who Frank Tanan is. Don't so you? Oh, I'm Absolute flamethrower. Played yeah. for the Angels, too, right, John? Right. Played for the Angels. Through, used to throw 100 mile an hour. And okay. Then, yeah. then he wound up losing his fastball, but then he became a junk ball pitcher and uh, and uh, really was uh, wound up playing you know, through what won the, the game in 1987 that uh, they beat uh, Toronto to get uh, that wasn't a word, was it? There was a pennant. They, they beat out the, yeah, it was a division game. There okay. you go. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. So, a sports guy. Yeah, sports guy. Pitcher. <laughs> he's a pitcher. Sorry about that. Yeah, well, plus he had an interesting life story because he's this golden-haired, superior athlete to everyone else. Could have played two or three different sports. Right. And just women fawning all over him. Got into that racy lifestyle in California before he had an evolution and a transformation. That's right. Yeah, found the Lord. Had a guy get him uh, on track with that and, uh, and wound up... Uh, Marion, uh, the girl who at one time was a exotic dancer, and she changed her life around too. So they're still to this day married. So mm-hmm. is that that's kind of an interesting story in and of itself. How did you guys ever get the chance to talk to Barry Sanders? Never did. Never talked mm-hmm. to Barry. Talked to Lem Barney. Okay. Yeah, my two. favorite football athlete of all time. That was fantastic because he, uh, my buddy John, we wound up going out to dinner with him one day. And yeah, we were up at Cal's place again. And I was there. Yeah, you were there too, weren't you? Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. How quickly we forget, Rick. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Did you bring the chickens? <laughs> yeah. Do, doing an impression of my wife. Yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, my buddy John had a poster of his where he's calling for a fair catch. Uh, and, and my buddy says to him, he says, man, he says, you know, it's always bugged me because Lem Barney did not call for fair catches. No. And he told the story. He says, oh, yeah. He says, I'll tell you when that was. It was against Buffalo. It was an exhibition game, and Joe Schmidt was their coach. And he says, look, and they had some injuries, and they, they weren't even going to put Lem back there for to field a punt, but they needed somebody to do that. And he says, I just want you to call a fair catch. He says, I don't, nothing, no heroics or anything. We just want to get out of here. It's sort, of, sort of like the Lions today. We just want to get out of here, get our loss, <laughs> and get it over with. Yeah. Nobody gets hurt. Yeah. And so, Nobody gets hurt but the fans. That's yeah, right, okay. yeah. So he said, you want me to do it? He said, yeah. So, he, so he's got it here. And he says, lo and behold, they snap that picture, and that becomes a poster. The yeah. one, I mean, he never, never took fair catches, and he's got one there. So <laughs> that's the name of that tune. Crazy. Yeah. Howard Kalen. Oh, man. Howard Kalen of... Uh, the Turtles. The Turtles. Wasn't that a... That was a fantastic... That could have went on for three weeks. Yeah. What a hilarious guy. Total really? recall. Upbeat was absolutely into the full hour with us. Uh, he's exactly what you'd want every interview to be. Right. And he... he what's the story he told us about, uh, about uh, songs? He said songs are way too long. Remember that? Yeah. He has this idea that the world... John and I were famous for putting montages together of different themes and things like that he thinks radio should always be that way because after the first 15 20 seconds you've heard the song so many times you're like hey i know that one then he says it should just roll right into the next one that's right yeah. he, he said he used the example hey hey paula he says after the guy goes hey hey paula <laughs> and then it just goes to the next song because you already know the rest of it well, that's definitely true for the songs today i yeah. mean they, they repeat oh, yeah. the last line especially sure? country songs right, right. Yeah. they repeat the last chord the chorus like what 15 yeah. times or so and right. it's like okay yeah. fade it out fade yeah. it out please sure yeah <laughs> but yeah he told the stories about uh, they were happened to be in england when uh, the beatles were releasing sergeant pepper oh wow so he got a chance to listen to who was it was a graham nash had 
had a copy that he borrowed from George Harrison. Okay. And they were listening to it the weekend before it was going to be released. Yeah. And he said, man, they put that on. And he said, it was unlike anything we'd ever heard of before. And did they did they record in Ab at Abbey Road? or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, so, you mean the, the Turtles? Yeah. No, they were just there visiting. They weren't okay. They weren't recording then. They just went there as a, a, a visiting thing. And uh, They recorded in the alley. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In the street yeah. where Paul walked across. But, uh, yeah. No, he talked I got to tell you, tell you guys, you could talk about the Beatles. Because I, I watch all these stupid shows, these documentaries, all the time. And, and Prime seems to have a ton of them. And there's one on there, and it's called... Uh, Paul McCartney is really dead. Hmm. And it tries to explain why Paul McCartney is dead right now. And it's it's so stupid. Really? It's I mean, they're, so they're still saying like he's dead? From yeah, yeah. This is somebody that's proving that he's still dead. Like he died back he died. in the day? Yeah. And back, so yeah, and they, they so had, this guy that had, had got, all these hits yeah, years later. Yeah. That, that, they, yeah. that they hired to replace wow. him is, you know. The, is really it actually, talented. Yeah, it's really yeah. talented. <laughs> exactly. Well, the, great, the greatest thing that ever happened uh, to them. The, that yeah, the guy, because this is like, he talks about, you know, when he died, it was like in the 60s. Yeah. Early sixties before he wrote sixty six or something, you know, like that. let yeah. it be and right. all this other stuff. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah. The I real agree. and see that's a good him. thing because the original Paul was actually out of ideas, right. so they had to bring the substitute in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Carry yeah John was scratching his head, and yeah. you know, Ringo just kind of said, "I don't do anything." <laughs> yeah, I play the drums <laughs> occasionally. Yeah. yeah, Paul was sitting there slobbering on himself, saying, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I can't do it, mate. Yeah. I, I'm out of ideas. Yeah. Now, what do you think? about this is it's kind of a switch over here as far as um, uh, um, George Martin to me I think George Martin was the real creator behind the Beatles myself Oh, I totally agree. I mean, I think if you know everybody's been taking credit for being the fifth Beatle, he yeah. truly was. He was. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he was a guy that came up with it. In fact, uh, Rick, we talked with uh, Dewey Bunnell of, of America. That was another great interview. That who got to forever. work with George? Who got to work with George, and he talked about it too. And I remember Rick said, "He said, yeah, no, we worked with this guy. We worked with George. I, I, I set it up. I said, so you worked with George Martin and all this stuff. And he, and then Rick says, yeah, you, you just wanted to give a guy, a, you know, just <laughs> give, give give a guy a little bit of experience." Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, but yeah, but they he took over um, America. Yeah, that's all you say. Back yeah. when uh, after the Beatles, he was pretty much he could do whatever he wanted. Right. George Martin, so he could pick his own, you know, who what he wanted to do. So it was really a feather in America's cap that he actually chose to work with them. Because there's a documentary on there about George Martin yeah. on on Prime Two, and he actually you know he's like I don't know God is he's got to be in his 80s or so when he did this interview, but he actually was very candid about. Yeah, some of the things in that he did say that. See, I never knew this one either. That he did say that Paul and and George stole the tapes from him on the final Let It Be album and had and wanted uh, him to remaster. No, he wanted. They wanted uh, Ron Spe um, Spector oh. to remaster. So. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a, there was a battle of that whole thing. Was uh, I mean was, after it, after George recorded everything, you know. Yeah, well, yeah. that was that, that was a big big brouhaha because and said he didn't want. His, his his junk put on it. His yeah, way, yeah. John said. Lennon yeah. told him that. Yeah, he says I don't want your junk put on it. Yeah. We want Phil Spector's junk put on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so that's a kind well, of the wall of sound. Yeah, exactly. And so they were going to take uh, George Martin because he did start working on it. With it, they're going to take yeah. him off. They weren't going to give him producing credit. Right. So George said, "I'm." And it was one of the times that George Martin actually kind of put his foot down and says, "No, you're not going to do that." Yeah. And he says, he says, "How about <laughs> George Martin said this to John? He said." How about if you do this? I got a solution. Put produced by George Martin, overproduced by Phil Spector. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I was really impressed by that one too. That, right. that documentary Ooh. with George Martin, because I always thought that he was a real reason that they did so well with some of their records, as well, far as you know. Yeah, and he started Sgt. out. Pepper. And he all started that. out doing comedy albums. I mean, he did, worked with the Goons, like Peter Sellers and those guys. Right, right. And that's why the Beatles kind of like at first when they said, "Wait a minute." But sound gonna... effects is another thing that he. Oh. Oh, he yeah. was good at for the comedy yeah. albums. I mean, they were a perfect marriage yeah. professionally. I mean, uh, but it, you know what it was was like I say, yeah, George and or uh, yeah, Paul and uh, and and John probably came up to him and said, "Can you make it do this or can you make it do that?" That was he, pretty much it. And yeah. He made it do it. He made it happen. Yeah, he made yeah. it happen. So yeah, yeah. So I was always a firm believer that you know he never got the credit that he deserved to you know. But then again, you know, Paul McCartney went on and wasn't using George Harris, wasn't using uh, George Martin, right? And he did very well for himself too but yeah. Yeah.
he just, did he just fall or yeah. <laughs> was that a toilet flushing or <laughs> we, you take us to the bathroom or what, that, what was that? That was not me. <laughs> oh. oh, that's yeah, that was Jim Morris and uh, Bob and Bobby. Bobby Morris, yeah. They were the. Uh, he was the captain, along with Paul Horning, of the Notre Dame teams in 1950. Bob Morris was, and I'm sorry, John, uh, Joe, what? Jim. Jim. <laughs> yeah, Jim. Just like it was yesterday. I remember. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, Jim Morris was, uh, he was the roommate of uh, Paul Horning's, probably his only male roommate, yeah, if you know Paul Horning's story. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then Bobby, of course, played for Catholic Central, as did uh, Jim, and uh, wound up having a career. I watched... Uh, a game against the Lions, of all things, that Bobby Morris returned a kick. I think he was playing for the San, uh, New Orleans Saints, returned a kick for a touchdown. Some of the most amazing things happened when you're a Lions fan. Yeah. 63-yard yeah. field goal. Well, I think the, the, Green, the Green Bay and Lions game was pretty good, too. Yeah, but, but yeah. yeah, they talked about, uh, you know, Jim talked about his time. He turned into a really successful businessman. and, uh, and, and Great benefactor for exactly. MCC. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that was, a, that was a fun time, too. I'm trying to think if there's any... You know, just uh, kind of the exploits of him and Paul back in the day at a Catholic school. That was kind of interesting. So. <laughs> um. Walt, I, I oh Walt Pierce Hater. Okay, yeah, Chicago. Yeah, what a great. Uh, I, I we sound like a broken record because, like I said, everybody we've done has been really, really good. I guess if if they wouldn't have been, we wouldn't have wasted our time putting them on our hard drive. Probably <laughs> now that I think about it. But uh, yeah, Walt is one of the originals of uh, what they were formed in '67, and he said, I forgot of the how many they had, but he says of that group that met in his basement. I mean, there's a phenomenal number of those guys that are still in the group um, Chicago to this day okay. still going strong and, and uh, you know very, very tight group and and uh, yeah see that's an, that's an interview that I was I was talking about to you I think last week I think or last time we talked is that right with with uh, Chicago what a what a what a great band they are to this day. Right. And Walt Perizator had something in common with Rick because Rick was a big Chicago fan, except during the uh, years with... Um, Peter Cetera. Peter Cetera. Yeah. Oh. And, we, and we found out that Walt and the horn section felt the same way because if you remember Peter's songs, they weren't necessarily the big horn yeah. sections. They were the pop songs. Yeah, that made it, it. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Ballady Crapola. Yeah, yeah. Ballady Crapola. <laughs> but, in fact, that was the name of their fourth album, wasn't there it? Was <laughs> there was a drop that I had when I used to work at Sunny FM that we used to use, and it was the Chicago talking about why Peter Cetera left. Yeah, and it's and just that's one thing it said. It said, "Well, Peter just didn't like the horns, and then we didn't really like Peter." It, it didn't sound. Yeah, it really didn't sound like. Yeah. There was, and he was one of the originals. I mean, he came yeah, in yeah. on the ground floor, so he'd been with them forever, and then all of a sudden it was like he, when he rose a little. Well, I'll tell you when he gained prominence. Who's the producer? Foster. Um, oh. What's not Foster Brooks. I no, know not, that. Yeah, not for, <laughs> Foster Brooks. No, uh, oh, the, the big uh, uh, last name Foster does all these stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I know what you're talking about, but I can't think yeah. of his name either. Yeah. Just, well, he took over. Yeah, they did Whitney Houston. and yeah, Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Celine yeah. Dion. Yes, he, well, yeah, he did. He did him. He did him, <laughs> baby. He did him, baby. <laughs> and and yeah, apparently Foster. Peter Cetera, too. And he smoked a cigarette afterward, but anyway. Yeah, but uh, then he, yeah, he, he wound up taking over Chicago and their music, and that's where oh, Peter, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. where Peter, that's when Peter rose shined. because yeah, he yeah. liked writing to that type I did, of stuff. I did yeah. see that documentary too. Yeah, I'm a big documentary guy, sure. as you can tell. And so that's that was the rise of Peter Cetera and yeah. kind of the fall of Chicago. As far as it was, yeah. the, like the rest of the band was like, oh. yeah. Then what if Peter Cetera done? I mean, afterwards he got uh, the glory of love from Karate Kid. You know, what, how many years ago was that? Yeah, now, thirty five years ago. Yeah. Now yeah. they got some other Cobra Cobra Two or something coming on now with uh, the guy that's playing the Karate Kid. Oh, Ralph yeah. Macchio. Yeah, Ralph Macchio. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's back. There's yeah. there's another program out with him. Yeah, but uh, yeah, Walt was uh, was was a great guy. Told talked about the death of uh, Terry Kath a little bit. Okay, because there was that yeah, urban legend watch around that, him. Watch that documentary too. Did you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, about everything from he killed himself to there was a hit on him to he yeah. didn't know the gun was yeah. loaded. The gun was you know so that, who knows. Still the whole the whole story that they gave still just a little too weird. Yeah, just a little too weird. Well, the the one thing that Walt said about the whole thing was he says all I know is that Terry was not a happy man yeah and he said that he you know he said well, that was after the break he broke from 
Chicago, though, wasn't it? No, he was still there. No, yeah. well, according to the documentary, they said that he was he was doing his own solo album. Maybe, maybe he was starting to work out him a little bit. But, but I thought he was still with them when he killed himself Probably, yeah. or shot yeah. himself, or somebody shot him, or who did it? Yeah. <laughs> Grassy Knoll, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Walt had his belief was that he never would have intentionally done that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and that was kind of the story that you heard was he right. didn't know the gun had bullet in it and right. just put it to his head and, and click and click yeah. and it actually there was something it wasn't a click there wasn't yeah. a click it was a bang yeah. yeah that's too bad but but the way they talked about him he was he was quite the gun enthusiast so you'd think he would have known I mean he took he, they say yeah. he take took apart guns so. and cleaned them you right. know yeah but anyway yeah. Um, but the, I was gonna tell you the, the guy that took over Peter Cetera's uh, spot the bass player he he was actually really really good too I mean. Did a really good job, right? Replacing so, um, I don't know what I was gonna. Oh, I know what I was gonna say was that with Peter Zadera, I remember you know when I knew that we weren't a rock station anymore when I had Rock ninety five and I was playing Peter Zadera <laughs> Gloria Love. Yeah, it's like okay, yeah. we're calling ourselves Rock ninety five, but this really uh, isn't rock. Yeah. It's, it's just, we have jumped the shark. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And Peter, a lot of he was another one that may, uh, people could debate me on this, and they could be right, but he was another one that it, it, you knew a Peter Zadera song. Yeah, I mean, it just it was the same dun 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 dun, yeah. dun and then that same voice, and it's like I get it. Well, he was a he'd be a he, perfect candidate for Howard Kalen. Hey, just uh, three words from Terry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, he's, yeah also, he's also the one that killed Amy Amy Grant's, uh, you know, whole thing, because they did that that one video with her. Oh, and uh, And then she, she was not uh, considered very much of a, a gospel singer anymore, because she oh. did this song about being in love with another guy, or something like that, and, wow. and I don't even remember what the song was. So she took, <laughs> took her down, too, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's another reason not to like him. Uh, last guy on the list I got here, Ron uh, Dante. Ron Dante. Oh mm-hmm. man, that was a that was an interesting. Uh, that was kind of a, an interview that when we set it up, we thought, uh, how interesting is this going to be? He's kind of the voice of the Archies. Yeah. You know, how, how much mileage are you going to get which, out of that? Which is kind of now. I had the Archies lunchbox. You had the <laughs> the monkeys. I had the Archies. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, but that's because you were a Betty and Veronica fan. Yeah. I was. Yeah, yeah. yeah I like. <laughs> I was hopping. You know, the uh, what's what's that? How that, about Jughead? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that Jughead man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, do you do you remember the the po- did you he tell you anything about the post cereal? Remember the post cereal when he came out with the records on the back and they had sugar sugar on the back? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. it was like the sugar bear. I think it was uh, the sugar. What do they call that? Sugar? <laughs> yeah, sugar. Sugar smacks. Lots sugar. of sugar smacks. Thank you. Yeah. Lots of sugar smacks. Yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah but sugar. on the back they had the the cut out records and you had uh, uh, Jingle Jangle, which was one of the I Archie's that, tunes yeah. And, yeah. and Sugar Sugar. And, right. Oh, yeah. I was a big, big fan of that. Yeah. No, he started out as a... Uh, Ruined my dad's record player, but anyway. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he started out just a lot like Barry Manilow, writing jingles yeah. and yeah, singing okay. jingles and stuff like yeah. that. And then they needed a voice for the Archie's, and he did that. He also... What was the what was the, the pop song that he had? I mean, he had several of them, but I mean, uh, you would never know it was him because it wasn't under Ron Dante. It was... Uh, was it Love Grows or My Rosemary... No, it wasn't that one. I no. Um, there's a lot of those people I'm, out there. I'm not going to remember either, but of course, he became a writer at the Brill Building. Yes, he did. Yeah. Which was huge. Sure. And so he would be writing. Uh, he, they Back then, they had a lot of these groups that really weren't groups. I mean, it was like the, the grassroots were really was a PJ Sloan that put that together. Right. That was part of a, a, a wrecking crew thing as well. And then all of a sudden, these things would hit. And they said, oh, we got to put a band together. Well, that's kind of like, you know, that's what kind of would, would happen. Yeah. And so he had, Dante had a lot of that type of stuff. And he would be like the lead singer on people, his songs that you wouldn't, you know, they'd have a whole nother oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, group and all that type of stuff. Also, the thing that was really gave him legs as far as being able to talk to him was he was a producer. Okay. He produced because of his relationship with uh, Barry Manilow back mm-hmm. when they were recording um, jingles together together um barry came was there more than jingles <laughs> yeah <laughs> but maybe but uh he wound up producing the first seven barry manilow albums okay and hel- helping arrange that type of stuff of course you had the mandy and Anna, well oh, yeah. barry yeah. winds up taking over and you would have never really known that how important he was, he was a clive davis yeah thing yeah. he winds up producing share 
Yeah. Um, I forgot how there was just a lot of people that you'd say, yeah. "Holy cow!" That this guy really behind the scenes really did a lot of stuff. So yeah, it was it turned a, to be a lot of depth in his resume yeah. that you know we had to uncover. Yeah, we thought it was just going to be sugar, sugar. I mean, yeah. we, 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 we would we'd hoped it wasn't going to be that. You know, we thought, okay, how are we? And then all of a sudden, you know, we did a little bit more right. Well, that's what we did. We read up on him, and yeah, we, yeah. we found out that okay, there's a little bit more depth to him. Well, that's, so, you know, when I first got my first top forty Billboard top forty book, it was just amazing. Some of the stories you actually. Right. sat there and read them you know sure. because it was amazing what, what you came up with and how many different people worked in so many different bands and yeah. how it got started do you remember uh, Gun Hill was it Gun Hill I can't back when my hair Gun was, Hill Gang Gun Hill oh yeah. like the first back. rapper song like Rapper's Delight no no no, no, no not Rapper's no. Delight um, these were long hair guys yeah yeah was, oh back when my hair, hair was, was short, short. Yeah, yeah. yeah 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 there was actually a documentary on those guys and I'm thinking this a has got to be a documentary on those yeah. guys there's only one song wasn't I know there? yeah yeah pretty much yeah. well there's a few songs but that was the only one that actually yeah. kind of broke out of the top 40 I think right. it. But, I think they um, were another Chicago band yeah uh-huh. yeah but they, but they, it was, it was, I'm thinking maybe this documentary is going to be really boring, but yeah, it wasn't. It, it was actually pretty one. interesting, yeah. you know, how these, these right. guys that, you know, just got together to do this little yeah. thing and it was actually turned out to be kind of like Tommy James with his first hanky panky where it was big, you know, right in his hometown in, in Niles and yeah. then it got big and. Yeah, Pittsburgh. 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 Yeah. yeah. So Pittsburgh put him on the map. Well, I, I can see John here. He's he's like holding himself. He has to go. <laughs> well, so. I, I would do that anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> it's lonely. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> I can hear the chickens calling you. So, <laughs> but I do I do really appreciate. It, even though it only took what three or four times of losing you on the phone, but hey, we we got it we got it all together here and got it got it done. So that yeah. I appreciate that. We had a lot uh, of fun, fun together. It was, uh, it was. Uh, I, we'd been together like twenty years, I think, yeah. or it seemed like it anyhow. And it, yeah, uh, we were closing in on twenty-four. Yeah, when they finally, when Rick decided to retire and said, "Hey, I've had enough of this." So <laughs> yeah. we, we, yeah. we, we got to do this again because she said you have Rick Scott some stuff that we if interviews. Yeah, and stuff Scott, that we talked about. Yeah. You've got some more. So yeah, we'll have to get together. I'll have to come up there and get a drive and get some stuff. And hey, we we could still live on the radio, Rick. Who yeah, knows? what but, you, you know, can do, John, is if you want to send me the list of stuff you give to oscar if i've got anything extra beyond that okay then you know i can just email it to you or okay you know oh and you'd send it in a in a flash drive it over or something yeah 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 well i know at least my uh, my sister will hear it so it'd be great yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes his sister loves us so. <laughs> now she loves me no, but you know i'm he, disappointed because i was hoping it was your niece yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, i can always tell her to start listening yeah, yeah. there we go <laughs> <laughs> John really has to go because yeah. I'm spitting on him now so yeah, there you that's go right. <laughs> I, got, I got my mask and goggles on yeah right <laughs> so you can only expect so much out of a bladder yeah <laughs> well, nice talking to you Rick we don't do this nearly enough yeah 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 we gotta do it again alright hey thanks Oscar alright thank you right. when, when do you wear tunes uh, he, he airs uh, Saturdays from 10 oh, till so there. Yeah, 10 or 10. And then you can get it. Well, you can get it. Where are you at anyway? He's in Reed City. I'm in Reed City. Oh, Reed City. He'll yeah, receive so it, but he won't yeah, get it. You know, so you'd have, you'd have to get you it. You know on. Reed City. It's like Everett without the glamour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember Reed. I used to have to drive. Anyway, another story, but forget about it. Um, oh, you're going to end up telling me that you slept with my wife inadvertently. Yeah. I, just, I can tell this is coming down. <laughs> that the road. was John, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, it no, was anybody anyway. but John. Yeah. But uh, uh, MuskegonRadio.com. Yeah, you can get oh, it sure. online. And so. uh, yeah, I was listening to it when I was driving around my my folks. You know, the, not my folks, folks, but my, oh, yeah. my clients. And I thought, man, it, 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 to hear these interviews again, I thought, hey, we did pretty good with that. That's yeah. really good.